Yeah. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, there's still people, oh, still pe illuminated people wandering in. Um, thank you very much for coming out on a sort of wintry afternoon. It's, it's great to see so many people here willing to give up their time and hear all about Barn and get engaged with the project. Um, this presentation is really, a, it's all about launching the Barn project, which we've been working on for quite a while. Okay, what's the problem we're trying to address? The problem is basically that broadband in rural areas is poor. Some people use another four-letter name for it, but poor will do. The problem is there are not many telephone exchanges. They serve large areas, so you've got long lines to properties and you get low speeds. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that are suffering from that problem. There is a new super-fast broadband, the next generation, a second generation of broadband being rolled out uh, by BT and Virgin Media. But the catch is... It's only going to get out to about two-thirds of the population, about 66%, using their own money, private finance. The government is making some additional money, about half a billion, which sounds a lot, but it isn't really, through something called BD UK, which is Broadband Delivery UK. It's part of the uh, DCMS, uh, um, central government. They're going to use that money to try and push the investment a bit further, and they're hoping for perhaps another 20%. So that gives us up to about, you know, 85%, 90%. The government's hoping for 90 Being realistic, I think they'll be lucky if they get more than about 80 to 85%. Um, the last 10 to 15% of, of properties are too far out, and it's so it's too expensive to service them, so they're not actually going to get any super-fast broadband provision. So those of you, like me, who live out in the country will get basic broadband, two megabits, probably via phone lines, maybe faster through satellite, Wi-Fi, 4G, telephony. But if you live in the rural areas, you're not going to get super fast broadband, uh, which we define as at least 25 megabits. Well, we define it's a lot faster than that, but the government defines it as at least 25 megabits. I think Brussels are talking about 30 megabits. Um, but what we want to achieve is, is true, very fast second generation broadband, speeds of 100 megabits a gigabit faster. And to do that, what you need is fibre all the way. You can't do it over copper, and you can't do it over radio or satellite. You need fibre. Does the lack of super-fast broadband matter? Yes, it does. It's vital for modern life. Farmers these days have to submit nearly all their forms to DEFRA online. Um, if you're trying to run a, a small business in the rural areas, you'll know only too well that, that the internet is vital. If you're a family living in the countryside, particularly if you've got children who are into social networking media, Twitters and blogs and all these techie things, I understand not, but seem to be very popular with the youth of today. Um, any parents that can't deliver that for their children are in deep trouble. And I mean, there are practical things. The costs of, of not using online are quite high. If you want to get comparative quotes for insurance or if you want to buy your utilities, if you don't do it via the internet, they charge you extra. Online banking... And this, you know, transport, car journeys, all those sorts of things. You have to use your car a lot more if you can't use the internet. So yes, it does matter. And in fact, it's life or death to the countryside. If we can't get decent broadband into the countryside, the risk is that jobs will migrate into the cities, businesses will migrate into the cities, and the, the vitals will be sucked out of the rural community. Um, I'm just going to show you a, a short video from, from Andrew Stott, who's the Director of Digital Engagement in the Cabinet Office, giving his take on this. Rural broadband presents a policy paradox. In rural areas, the benefits of really high-speed broadband will be more profound. Those are areas where it's otherwise very difficult to access public services or access entertainment, where reception of terrestrial entertainment services is very poor, and where just the distances uh, prevent some of the things that urban dwellers just find easy, easy to do. And really high-speed broadband will make those easier. Yet at the same time, the big players have largely ignored rural areas. They've concentrated on the urban areas where it's easy to install high-speed broadband and where the returns are quicker. So I welcome the launch today of Broadband for the Rural North, uh, which will help address those issues. And what's more, it really shows how a community-led enterprise can very quickly achieve results that the big players have consistently failed to do over a number of years. And I wish Broadband for the Rural North really well. Thank you. 
there's another one that's very interesting as well. I mean, that we've heard there from sort of government level about the importance of broadband. But you're probably all familiar with, with Google. Uh, and Google has, has got some similar projects to ours. The big difference is they're doing fibre in the city and they've selected Kansas City to run out a similar fibre network to ourselves. So they're doing urban, we're doing rural. But they're very aware of what we're up to and they've sent us a little um, congratulations video. Greetings from your friends overseas. I'm Sarah Wood, a member of the Social Media Club of Kansas City and a resident of the first Google Fiber City. We've heard a lot about the Barn Initiative and we're very excited to see what great things come from it. A couple of days ago, Chris and Martin told me that you're a go for breaking ground. Very exciting. We've got another few months before Google starts work here, so admittedly we're a bit jealous. From everyone at your sister broadband city in the U.S., Congratulations. Um, okay, so we know we need fiber, we know we need broadband. If the commercial marketplace hasn't done it so far, are they going to do it? Uh, you could argue that once everybody else has super fast broadband, they might use any surplus money they've got to do the rural areas. In the, at the moment, they're not going to because they can get a much better <laughs> business return investing in the towns and in the rural. But if we wait for that, I don't think anybody in this room is likely to be alive by the time they get round to it. So it's probably not, not a good one to wait on. Government support. OK, if we were to do the last 10, 15 percent, it's going to need billions of pounds of subsidy. Uh, I think anybody who's opened a newspaper, turned on the telly or listened to the radio over the last few months will know state piggy bank is empty. And there's a lot of conflicting demands for any cash the government has. Uh, I don't think we're going to be top of their priority list. So we might get some help, but we're certainly not going to get the complete funding we need to, to do the project. So it's down to us, guys. It's the community. So the only way we're going to get super fast broadband out in the rural areas is if the rural communities get together and make it happen. Can we do a fibre to the home project? I think that's a question a lot of people ask. Can we do one that will deliver true next generation access speeds? That's a gigabit, it's a thousand megabits now, upgradable to 10 or 100 gigabits when we need it. Future proofed for generations to come. We don't want to be coming and doing this every three years. Life's too short. We want to solve it once and for all. Affordable, 30 pound a month is where we set our target. Some argument about affordability there, but uh, believe me, it's cheaper than anywhere else in the world is going to deliver this. So it, it shows what a community can do. But people think it's rocket science. They've all seen the adverts for Infinity and, and Virgin Media's networks, all these you know, flashy, flashy lights and all the rest of it, and they think it's like launching the Atlantis Space Shuttle. It isn't. It needn't be complicated. There are ways of doing it that are quite uh, simple and cheap. For a starter, you go cross-country. This is the countryside. There's lots of farmland out there. We don't want to go down roads. We'll go over cross-country go over private farmland. We use small ducts. This is the size of the duct we're using. This is 16 mil. Smaller than the standard water pipe you put out to your greenhouse. And that's what we've got to get into the ground. By using small ducts like that, the, the material costs are kept down. We can install it using mole ploughing or, or open trench digging. And then we use something called blown fibre. That's actually a 96 fibre cable. And once you've got the duct in, you simply use compressed air to blow that. And you can blow it kilometres down that pipe once you've got it. So what you can actually do is get everybody out there putting this across their land over the routes that we've, we've told them to, 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 to do. Remember that that's the sort of land we're talking about. You couldn't do a community project in a city. No way can you dig up pavements and roads for obvious reasons. But that's what we're dealing with. I mean, it's fundamentally, that is the Boland Fells. And you can see really, it's you won't see a lot of houses there. As you all know, we're fairly sparsely populated out here. But what you have got is a load of open farmland, uh, stone walls that you've got to get through, uh, becks and streams you've got to cross. But fundamentally, what you haven't got is tarmac and you haven't got built up areas that, that cause you all sorts of problems. So that, that's the sort of thing we're, we've got to work with through. We've done a detailed network design. Uh, barn project, this is the launch, but believe me, we've, there's an awful lot of work that's been going on for the last two years. We've crawled all over every inch of this, the territory. We've got a complete design. It's going to cost us 1.86 million. 
But the important thing about it, because it's a community project, is it's 100% of properties in the areas that we're covering. Uh, no ifs, no buts, no one's too far away or too expensive. Um, that's the difference between a community project and a commercial one. Um, because it's community, we're not going to leave anybody out. Of that 1.86 million, about a third of it's labour and two thirds material. And materials include labour we can't do ourselves. But I showed you the picture of, of the sort of countryside we're working on. When it comes to putting ducts in that, uh, this sort of duct under the ground in that area, the vast bulk of the work can be done by the community. They can make openings in walls, they can repair the walls afterwards, uh, make, make gaps through fences. All of that sort of work is, is doable. Having got the design, we worked out what it would cost. We worked out what the running costs would be. And what we basically said was, OK, does the community want this to happen? If we're going to make it happen, we need to have a reasonable level of sign-up. And the figure we worked on was about a 50% take-up. So there's about 1,500 properties out there. We said if we could get roughly half of them. At that point, I think we had about 1,300. One of the problems with the design is that every time you, 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 you look at it again, you find there's another cluster of properties 50 yards further on that you can make a very good case for connecting. So there's a bit of a moving feast in a way. And I think we started off at about uh, 1,300. And I think we're up to nearly 1,500. And that there's always somebody just one field away that, that, that's, that's worth connecting and can make a very good case. And we're all softies and we, we'd like to connect everybody, so it keeps growing. But originally, I think the 50%, I think, was 600 and odd people. So what we decided to do was, was test, the, test you all out and see, are there enough people in the rural community who would be interested in taking service at £30 a month? And are there enough of you out there that are willing to put your hands in your pocket, put up money, people who are willing to put the effort and time and the work in, grant way leaves, give us permissions to dig across land, all those sorts of things. So we launched the website to find out. And what we, what we, we launched it in July. And by the end of November, we had enough sign-ups to, to convince us that, that the project was completely viable. Press the go button. Right, we need to raise the money. We've had 700 sign-ups to buy shares so far. A surprising number of them are from outside our service area. A lot of people are watching what we're doing and are rather delighted that somebody's actually doing it. And they, I think that there's a tremendous well of, of, of good wishes for us out there. For, for several reasons. Number one, they want to see us succeed. But if we can do it here, it's something that can be taken everywhere else. Other people can do the, take advantage of all the heavy lifting work we've done in establishing the model and, and uh, the methodologies, and they can take it elsewhere. We need the community to put labour in, not just money, but labour. And we've been pleasantly surprised how many people there are out there with mini diggers and, and equipment who signed up to, to dig across their land and neighbours' lands and wherever we need it. So we're confident that of that one third of the price that's down to labour can be delivered by the community. We won't have to buy it in externally. And we've also been pleasantly surprised how many housewives are happy to dig across their garden for us, which is you know, brilliant. Uh, one thing we do need is we need landowners to give us permission to put that in their, in their, in their land, and that's something called a way leave. And again, on when we put the website up, people signing up, there was a thing there, a box to tick saying, I'm a landowner in this area, and yes, I'm happy to give you way leaves to cross it. Um, we haven't had a refusal so far. Uh, a lot of people said in the early days that um, <coughs> you'll, you'll run into problems getting, getting way leave permission from landowners. We, we didn't think so. We, we felt that as long as the project was clearly a community project and it's done through a community benefit uh, organisation and nobody's going to make any money out of them, we felt that people would sign up and I, I think you're right. It's a good example of the community spirit. Lancashire, I think, leads the world when it comes to community spirit and we've been really um, inspired by how many people have signed up for it. And we had an awful lot of support. I mean, examples... Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but you know, one of the local large landowners is Grosvenor, the Abbeystead Estate, the Duke of Westminster. He's sent us a very nice letter um, wishing us best wishes. And you know, they've agreed to give us way leaves and things like that and support us. They see the value to the community. Um, I keep talking about labour and skills. 80% um, of the labour costs are digging ducts and crossing walls and fences. And plenty of people know how to do that. They've got the equipment and they're signing up. The other 20% is down to the slightly cleverer bit of, of blowing the fibre in, doing all the splicing, all that sort of thing. Um, that's not something that tends to, not a skill that, that is plentiful in the rural communities. So 
Uh, as part of the project, what we've done is we've, we've made money available in, 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 the, um, in the budget to take a number of volunteers from the community who are interested in this, put them through the formal training courses, so they'll have the industry qualifications in fibre splicing and installation, same ones that BT engineers or Virgin Media engineers have. We'll put them through that training at our expense in return for them then volunteering to do the work of putting the fibre in and we'll buy the equipment in they need. And one of the good things then is that once the build is completed, we've actually put skills into the community, skills that can be used by people to make a living from maintaining the network or selling their services outside of the area. So it's, it's a big thing. The whole management committee is absolutely signed up to this, that every penny we can humanly spend within our community is going to get spent within our community. Uh, we don't want any money to leach out if we can avoid it. Some will have to. But believe me, we will, we will move heaven and earth to make sure that the money you pay in subscriptions is spent locally. I said we, we, we dig the stuff in. How do we do it? OK, well, I won't get too technical on this, but basically one way of doing it is, you know, you just dig the normal trench and you drop your 16 mil duct in. There might be more than that. There might be, you know, there's four in a container, so you might have one or four, anything up to seven of those, depending on how much fibre we need. And you just basically dig a trench, drop it in, cover it over. Um, other way you can do it is mould ploughing, and I'm going to show you a video of a mould ploughing in a second when we've had a look at this one. Um, when you come to roads, I mean the nice thing about mould ploughing is you can actually do long distances in a day, which gets the cost down. On roads you do a technique called micro trenching, you literally cut a slot into the road, lift it up, drop the duct in, drop the, the cover back on, and then you put a bit of tarmac to, you know, a bit of bitumen to seal it off again. Quite fast. Ideally, we won't be using roads much, but there will be odd places where the geography will force us to come off farmland onto roads. And where we do, that's the technique we'll use. We are not going to do this big um, uh, excavation you typically see, you know, uh, which is very expensive and involves lots of traffic control and everything else. The nice thing about micro trench, you can go down two, three hundred metres in a day and you're off the road again. So minimum disruption. Um, and the other thing we have is, is, of course, plenty of water up here. So despite all the droughts down south, I haven't really seen much trace of it up here recently. So we have streams, becks, rivers uh, that we have to cross. And some of those we will actually have to drill underneath. And there's a modern oil exploration technique. They can drill and make the bit, bit come up the other side very accurately. You know, within a few inches, it's amazing what they can do. So mould ploughing, just a little video that uh, Christine made. This is the mould ploughing action. As you can see, the biggest mess it's making is flattening the grass, which my husband wasn't very pleased about. If we'd done it a couple of weeks sooner, the grass wouldn't have been as long, but it's very low impact. It's burying the fibre to the correct depth to avoid the drains, but be deep enough if the field's ever ploughed. It's a fantastic mow plough, is this? And we did about four fields in half an hour. Um, basically something like that, you can get anything up to about three kilometres a day depending on how many obstructions you've got. Um, I think this particular one, Chris, was about 750 metres, didn't they, three quarters of a kilometre in, in a short day? Uh, three or four hours. Yeah, so it is astonishing. So although we've got big distances, and I'll talk about some of the distances in a minute, uh, they're not as scary as they actually sound. They're not scary as if you have the same numbers in town. So let's have a look at some numbers. Barn is going to do eight parishes, 100%. That's over Risedale, uh, Quirma, Robendale, Ray, Tatum, Wennington, Melling and Arcombe. And we're doing absolutely every property in any of those parishes. So if you live in one of those parishes, you don't have to ask if you're included. You are. OK. We are also spilling over the edges of some of those um, where I mentioned earlier that for one reason or another, we, we have clusters of properties that are sensibly served at the same time. Some of them are actually even outside Lancashire. I mean, Burtney, Lonsdale, Low Bentham. I'm not sure about Burtney, Lonsdale. Yeah, that's, that's in, is it that North Yorkshire or is it Cumbria? Right, it's abroad. Um, and also places like Little Dale, uh, where we have to go through Little Dale to get over to Robendale. So we're doing all the Little Dale properties. To put a, a sense of proportion around that, 243 kilometres square. Uh, that's quite a scary number. 1,451 properties. Um, when you actually work out how many properties per hectare, you begin to realise how sparsely populated our parishes are. If you had 243 square kilometres in, in an urban area, you'd have noughts on the end of those properties. 
uh, and that's why it's so expensive out here. Big distances, small numbers of properties. What we're doing is we're running 41 trunk routes. Those are the routes that have got the, the big stuff on it. I keep picking up a different colour each time, but there's, there's, no, there's no significance to that. They all do the same job. It's just if you've got several in the ground at once, it's handy if they're coloured differently so you know which one it is. Um, it's 41 routes and 275,000 metres of duck distance. So that, that means, you know, actual kilometres that we have, actual metres we have to dig. And we're going to put into that the fibre, just to put it in context, 20,000 kilometres of fibre has to go in. Now, that's because there's 96 in there, so, you know, a kilometre of that is 96 kilometres of fibre, so don't get too excited. But uh, it's just to give you some numbers. That is the map for those of you who uh, are happier with maps, like me. The shaded green ones are the parishes we're doing, and you'll see some parishes have got little bits of green around the edges. They're the spillover ones, so, for instance, here you've got crossing across Littledale there, so that, that's included. Uh, we go over the border into uh, Scotford there, we're into Dolphin Home, the edge of Dolphin Home, you get as far as the, uh, the school and that bit in Dolphin Home. How are we doing it? We're doing this by setting up a company, and that's Broadband for the Rural North, which I've mentioned. It's a mutual society, a not-for-profit community benefit society, so it's similar to a co-op, but the difference is a co-op uh, gives its money back to its shareholders. So if you're a member of a co-op, you get your divvy, and the divvy is basically the profits coming back to you. Where we're different is profits don't come back to the shareholders. We have to work for the benefit of the community. So any profits we make, we have to plough back into the community. So there's no, there's no money to be distributed to anybody. Um, because it's a mutual benefit, a mutual society, it's one member, one vote. It doesn't matter whether you've got the minimum 100 shares or the maximum 20,000, you are a member and a member gets one vote. There is an asset lock and what that means is that the, the, the network we're building and all the assets we buy with, with your money um, have to be kept for the benefit of the community. We can't sell them off. Uh, nobody can make a profit out of this. There's no capital gains to be made and there's no windfall from selling it all to somebody else. The community is putting the time, the effort and the money in and what we build will be kept for the community for all time. <laughs> Building it. Well, funding commences today, so get your checkbooks out before you go. We'll frisk you at the door and make sure you've filled in a form and left us a check. Um, late January, early February, we expect to start digging. Uh, that's really just a function of weather more than anything. Uh, you know, were we to have a nice Indian summer in January or something, we would probably start digging earlier. I suspect we'll be knee-deep in a bog for most of January and it'll be difficult to do much digging. Uh, but that's really what's going to stop us. Uh, we're, we're confident that money will start flowing in quite quickly. As soon as it does, we'll be buying the materials in and we'll be out there with the diggers. Eleven of those 41 routes are the core routes that link the villages together. And we have to put those in first to make sure we can get connectivity to places like uh, Abbey Stead and, and Ray and, and all the rest of it from our head end, which is in Corma. That involves 40 kilometres of duct, ready for service targets Easter. And along those main ducts, there are also 350 of the premises are on, on, on those main ducts. What we'll then do is we'll, we'll carry on and we'll do all 41 routes during the year and all 451 premises will be passed. So we, we expect to complete the build out by the end of 2012. Anybody who's applied for a connection already and registered or, you know, will fill in the paperwork and ask for one, will be, we'll, we'll dig to them at the same time as we're doing the trunks going past them. The, the way we're going to do it is we will try and organise things. Now, we will organise things. We won't try. We will to make sure we never have to dig twice. We're not going to do the sort of the gas board thing of five teams of engineers arriving on consecutive months. Um, you know, we'll make sure if we're going to dig, we're going to dig once and we'll make sure the right fibre's in it. We know where all the properties are uh, and we've allowed for every single one. So we can do it in one run. We've got a lot of enthusiastic volunteers. And one of the things we're going to do is individual landowners will agree the route across their land we'll agree who's going to do the digging and we'll issue them this duct. So what we've got is dozens, hundreds of digs going on at the same time on different bits of land. As long as we agree where the start and end bit is across each bit of land, all we need to do once they put that in is use just a compression coupler. You can just push these together and drop them back into the ground and cover them over. So each bit of it is very low tech. 
for each, you know, you've got lots and lots of different bits of work going on all at the same time, scattered right across our area. Um, so that, that's the first bit, that, that's the bit where we're telling you about what the actual project is. And now I'm going to do a, a bit about the actual fundraising. Uh, I mentioned before that, that Barn is a uh, industrial and provident society community benefit. So we've done that. Uh, that's the mechanism we're going to use. And it's important to remember that Barn is a community initiative. It is not a company that's come in from somewhere else with a load of money. It is entirely sprung from the, from the needs of the community. People like myself and others in this room who, who live out here in the rural areas getting together and saying, you know, we've got to do something about it. Barn is what we've set up to do it. To be a member of Barn, you have to buy shares. The minimum investment is £100. The maximum is 20,000. 20,000 is a legal upper limit. It's nothing to do with us. The Industrial and Providence Society Act sets an upper limit of 20,000 to, to be uh, the upper limit. And the reason for that is it, because these are sort of interesting cooperative mutual projects, setting an upper threshold like that means that you know, the risk of anybody being bankrupted or anything about any of these schemes is minimal. So the, the Financial Services Authority can adopt a fairly hands-off approach. It's a mutual society, so one member, one vote. From year four, the investment you put in, you can start withdrawing it if you want. You can apply to it. And you remain a member as long as you've got £100 worth of shares. If you withdraw all your shares, then you cease to be a member. You're no longer eligible to vote and determine policy. Building the network is going to cost us £1.86 million, of which two-thirds is materials, one-third is labour. So we're going to issue 2 million shares with a £1 face value. And we've gone for 2 million because it gives us a little buffer above what we think our building costs are. And contingency is a nice thing to have because things can go wrong. Perish the thought. I'm sure they won't. But um, it's like allowing extra time for, for a, a transport to trip, isn't it? You know, if, if you allow plenty of time, you never need it. And if you don't, you do. Um, the other reason for two million is the, the, the enterprise investment scheme, that is the upper limit, and I'll, I'll talk about the enterprise investment scheme in a second, but that's the upper limit for 2010, 2011. We're issuing two types of shares, a type A which anyone can buy, uh, all you need is money, and a type B which we're reserving for people who are actually doing work on the project. I'll say more about that in a minute. So standard shares, anybody wants to buy them, minimum is 100. That makes you a member of Barn and you get a vote. If you buy 500 shares or more, you're eligible for the uh, Enterprise Investment Scheme. That gives you tax relief of 30% on the value of the shares purchased. So if you buy 1,000 shares, 1,000 pounds, you can claim 300 pounds back from the tax man, which is quite nice to get something back from the tax man. I think we all like that. Type B shares, uh, we want people to get involved with this. It's, it's not just about getting people to dig. We want people to be part of this project. It's your project. It's the communities. So we want to encourage people to, to put effort in. And one way we can see of rewarding that effort is by paying people for that effort, but paying them in shares. And these are the B-type shares, which are reserved for purchase by those who are doing the work. So it's paid for with sweat rather than swag. Uh, it recognises volunteers' efforts and, and it allows you to build a long-term stake in the project. Um, I mentioned Enterprise Investment Scheme. Both the A and the B shares are the same as far as they're concerned. Um, they're eligible for tax relief. We've submitted details of the plan. All the paperwork has been to HMRC and we've had a certificate back from them saying that we do conform with the Enterprise Investment Scheme. So there shouldn't be any nasty surprises there. Um, the only question mark from your point of view is whether your circumstances are compatible with, with the EIS. Think, it's a, quite simple things. I mean, really, it comes down to have you paid tax in this year or in the previous tax year uh, of at least the amount they're refunding you. Um, there's not a lot else. Um, there are a few rules uh, affecting people who are considered to be associated with the company, directors, that sort of thing. It's not going to affect anybody in this room. So basically, you shouldn't have any problems. But if you've got a financial advisor, do talk to them. Uh, you'll see on the shares application form, there's a tick box. If you're planning on claiming the IS tax relief, let us know and we send you a certificate. And that certificate you send on to your tax office 
simple as that. And in the fullness of time, you get money back from them. Um, I suspect they demand money quicker than they return money, but um, we'll see. Um, shares in a, a mutual industrial provenance society are a bit different from the shares that you're always reading about in the papers. You can't, that they're withdrawable shares, they're not transferable. That means that you cannot sell your shares to anybody else. You can only sell them back to barn. Um, they're not liquid, is, is the technical term for that. Um, a lot of shares are not liquid, to be quite fair. I mean, a lot of small, particularly family-owned businesses have shares that you can't readily sell. There is no market for them. In our particular case, you know, Barn, Barn will be looking to buy those shares back. Um, the part of the enterprise investment scheme says that uh, you, you have to hold the shares for three years. You mustn't cash them in. If you cash them in within three years, you lose the tax relief. However, our rules on the shares, which we made very clear to everybody, is you can't withdraw your money anyway for the first three years. So that's a non-issue. You will find in our business plan all sorts of, which is available to you on the web, lots more detail than this. I'm not going to try and summarise everything verbally. Um, we won't pay any interest on those shares in the first three years, but you are getting the 30% EIS, which is worth a lot. In year four and afterwards, we aim to pay 5% interest annually. We can't guarantee to do it because it's going to depend on the trading situation for Barm when we get through to year four. But based on our best estimates in our business plan, and again, it's in the documentation that you'll see on the web, uh, we believe that we can comfortably achieve 5%. From, from year four and onwards, but it's not a guarantee. The way we're going to handle it is when you become a member, you'll get a shares account and we'll credit that with the number of shares you've bought. We'll also send you a certificate, but it's fine. And we'll pay you interest by adding shares of an appropriate value. So you've got a thousand shares and we, we pay 5%. We would put in 50, 50 pounds worth of shares with the caveat that uh, because it's, it's interest, um, we will have to hold back whatever the tax man says we need to hold back against your tax liability. But basically, that's how we'll handle it. Um, if you want to get the money out, what you'll do then is simply apply to withdraw those, those interest shares or any others you want. Our business plan says that from year four onwards, we'll be making £200,000 per annum available to meet re requests from investors who want to withdraw their capital, and we'll allow for 5% interest. Um, okay, what, why, what, what, what incentives can we give you to invest? Well, some of you are going to invest because you desperately want the broadband. Um, there will be other people who will uh, maybe not be quite so enthusiastic about that. Or they don't see the value quite so much. So we're trying to put together a package that actually makes it an interesting and, and, and worthwhile investment for them. So one of the things we've done is we've said if you buy £1,500 worth of shares or more, you can nominate a property that will get a free connection and a year's free service. So that's worth about £510. So it pulls down the cost. And because we want your money quickly, because we want to get out there with our mini JCBs making a, a mess of fields all over the parishes uh, as quickly as possible, we, we want that money now. Uh, so we're doing a little sort of um, extra bonus, if you like, that if people who buy shares before the 29th of February, that's about three months away, we'll get 15 months instead of 12 which in increases the value to about 600. One thing to be aware of, because we are giving you something that is value, and uh, the old jolly tax man, any time you give anybody anything, always wants to claw his bit back of it. So, you know, he will treat that as value and he'll try and reduce your tax relief uh, by that amount. So um, if you've got a financial advisor, uh, discuss it with them because there are probably all sorts of clever ways of structuring that. But I'm not a financial advisor. Um, all I can say is be aware that the tax, the tax man is watching you. And that's basically it, really. Um, thank you very much for coming. We're all going to... Uh, but we'll have a questions and answer now that you can sort of um, get anything off your chest you want. And there'll be people around for the next uh, couple of hours if you want sort of individual... Uh, discussions of any sort about anything, we'll be very happy to do it. And just the last slide, this is one that Chris did, which I absolutely love, you know, uh, www. <laughs> barn Brilliant. So I think Christine's going to use that as her Christmas card. I, I think it's sort of 
how she managed to get the, all the sheep to stay there while she was doing the photo, I have no idea. So 10 out of 10 for effort there. Well, thank you very much.